Street Joinery and the American Craftsman Podcast are proud to partner with Montana Brand Tools. Montana Brand Tools are manufactured by Rocky Mountain Twist in Montana, USA. With numerous patents dating back to the invention of the hex shank system by our founders, we strive to produce accessories that add precision, flexibility, and efficiency to your toolkit. In addition to woodworking tools, we produce many high-quality cutting tools that are used by the aerospace, medical, automotive, and industrial markets. Our end product has a fit and finish that is beyond comparison. Montana brand tools are guaranteed for life to be free of defects in material and workmanship because we build these tools with pride and determination. For 10% off your order, visit montanabrandtools.com and use the coupon code American Craftsman. All right, here we are. Back at it. Buckle up. (laughs) Season two, episode six. We're, uh, well, you probably read the title by now, but we're going to be covering a, a, uh, very important person in terms of colonial furniture. Yeah, yeah. Um, persons of note. Mm-hmm. Um, so last uh, last week we talked about really what colonial furniture was, right. what it became. And we mentioned in passing, uh, and you know, except for Chippendale, we, we did spend a bit of time on him because his style was... Um, so dominant and such a big part of uh, colonial furniture. But uh, we're going to start off this episode with a, a cabinet-making family, a couple of families, actually, that were intertwined. Um, and a couple of people I never heard of, but wound up being, like, super important. Uh, it We'll start with the Townsend family, like uh, Pete Townsend, mm-hmm. Townsend. Um, and the Goddard family. So the Townsends and the Goddards, they're two Quaker families. Mm -hmm. They settle in the Quaker community of the Point, which is uh, a neighborhood of Newport, Rhode Island. Okay. And uh, they start uh, plying their trade. Now we're talking about um, the, the first guys, our job, and his brother, Christopher. Oh, I thought that was a typo. I'm like, that's got to be John. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's name is Job. Job. Or just Job. I don't know if it's Job. I mean, I knew somebody named Job, but mm-hmm. he had an E on the end of it. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not, and I don't know enough of my Bible to know if that's a biblical name. Yeah. Some Somewhere deep in the recesses of my mind, it sounds like it could be. Yeah. Yeah, like Quaker... You know, makes me lean towards yeah. That now the Quakers were they they were an offshoot of the Puritans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah so they're essentially uh, you know immigrants fleeing religious persecution in mm-hmm. Europe, and they came over probably with very little, just a, a tin of rolled oats. <laughs> Yeah, That's what's the deal got. with Quaker oats? How did <laughs> we? I should have done some. Yeah, research. I mean, they got a Quaker guy on the front. Yeah, I I learned about that at some point. I I can't Quaker remember. Oats? Yeah, I can't remember <laughs> where it originated, but <laughs> somebody's gonna have to the 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 big drawback in doing our our formatting like this is. We're a little bit removed from the replies and things yeah, like that from yeah. our listeners. Yep. Because now um, we're even a, a week further down the line into the future. Yeah, this will be coming out like around... Uh, will it be three weeks from now? It'll be, yeah, like Halloween, like maybe the week after Halloween, something like that. Wow, yeah. wow. Um, so Job and Christopher, we're, we're talking about guys that were born 1700. Mm-hmm. 1699 and 1701, they're two years apart. Yep. So they probably get to uh, the colonies when they're in their 20s. So okay, then we'll place them, uh, you know, in uh, in Rhode Island in their Early 20s. 1700s. Yeah, 30s. In fact, they didn't land in Rhode Island. They landed, um, I think, um, was Christopher, was he was originally in Long Island, New York. Okay. Uh, we know a couple of Long Island guys. Yeah. Shout out. Yeah. 
Rob DeMarco and CT, yeah. CT Woodwork, out there on the island. Uh, I'm actually from the island. Yeah. You yeah. Know, people actually, don't, I, I never thought of it that way that Brooklyn and Queens were part of yeah, Long Island. Yeah. I'm from Brooklyn, so it's part of Long Island. Anyway, we digress. You may, you may, uh, <laughs> Some Brooklynites may be uh, aggravated by that, <laughs> offended. that lumping together. <laughs> offended by the fact that they're Long Islanders. Yeah. Oh man, it's funny, that, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Well, nowadays Brooklyn's so different. I mean, Brooklyn is hipster central. It's true. Ninety nine percent of those people weren't born there. <laughs> That's right. So they make their way up to um, Newport, and. Their Newport is not the furniture building capital of New England at this point in time. It's Boston. Okay. Um, and these guys are the first generation of the Townsends to get involved in cabinet making. Job's daughter marries uh, John Goddard, hmm. who was his apprentice of the Goddard School. I want, you know what? These names keep popping up. Yeah, it's those old. Uh... Those old names. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised at all if there's a, a relationship there. Me neither. So um, John Goddard is an apprentice. He, so apparently he's younger. Uh, well, you never know in those days. Not to be confused with John Gotti. <laughs> and, and thus begins the partnership of the Townsend and Goddard families. Um, so job being the first guy, he's the oldest brother. There's only one piece that's got his name on it, hmm. uh, that survives. It's in the, it's in RISD, Rhode Island School of Design in Providence. And, um, it's, uh, well, no, it says the only piece bearing jobs label is a desk bookcase at the Rhode Island School of Design yeah. in Providence. I mean, RISD is no slouch of a place to be uh, displayed. Yeah. Other pieces attributed to attributed to yeah, him. So not 100% right. confirmed. Include a chest of drawers and a dressing table. Hmm. Um, now, they have a hard time. When you're going back in time trying to figure these things out, if you've ever watched Antiques Roadshow, you know, I love that show. <laughs> there's a lot of guesswork going on. Yeah. Christopher's work was apparently much like that of his brother. When, no uh, surprise there. And uh, although no existing piece was definitely attributed to him until the late 20th century, uh, a secretary he built in 1740, which had been moved to France in 1800. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to file this piece of furniture built in uh, Providence around 1740, 60 years later, it gets moved over to France and then it gets discovered. Guess how much it sold for at auction? Uh, well, I spoiled, I spoiled that. You guys guess three, two, two one, one. <laughs> $8 million. Wow. So it, you know, you see stuff on the antiques roadshow again, the back, back into that where there are pieces of furniture that are that old or almost that old, and they're worth 5000 10000 So it shows you the importance of um, the town's in name because that's what makes it worth money. Uh, it's, it's the first generation of town's um uh, building in Newport, Rhode Island, and it's the only piece attributed directly to Christopher, mm -hmm. eight million bucks. So again, you got you got Job and Christopher. Five of Job's sons become cabinet makers. Man, yeah, yeah, just just five. You know, people had a lot of kids back there. Back I was gonna then. say, man, it doesn't say all of his sons. Just no, five, five of his five. sons. How many yeah. daughters did he have, and how many other sons? My God, and. You know, I have some notes here that kind of go through who was who. Uh, you had Job Edward Townsend Jr. He has a couple of pieces. Edmund Townsend, Thomas Townsend. <laughs> Interesting note about Thomas. He he was banished to Massachusetts by the British wow. <laughs> and later became an innkeeper. 
He hung up the tool belt. <laughs> Old Tommy. <laughs> so Tommy Townsend didn't continue in the in the trade. He was a troublemaker, yeah. apparently. <laughs> and Robert, the fifth son, he, he died in 1805. So he didn't he didn't have too long. Yeah. But he left the cabinet making business uh, that was taken over by Job the Second, mm. uh, Job Edward Townsend. So uh, it looks like Job Edward was probably the oldest. Yep. He was the junior, and he was the most uh, prolific. Yeah, it seems like he was probably born right around the time of immigration by mm -hmm. by uh, job number one. Yeah, job the first, because, yeah, his birth date is 726. Mm -hmm. um, and the, this is, it says, the second generation of Newport cabinet makers from these families are perhaps the best known. So... Um, I would consider that the, the third generation. They're not including uh, the first because it's John Townsend. He's he's the big name here, John mm -hmm. Townsend. Uh, he's the oh he's the son of Christopher. Okay, so we're getting to Christopher's kids. Gotcha. Those first five were Jobs' kids. Christopher's kid John is is the big name. Yeah, that's the name I know, John Townsend. Yeah. There's actually a YouTube channel. It's like John Townsend, something or another. It's, I don't know how I ended up getting these videos suggested, but it's like uh, these historical reenactor people. And I think they, they have a website where they sell all this BS. Mm -hmm. BS. Sorry if, you, if you're into this <laughs> stuff. Sorry if you're, yeah, if you're into dressing up like a, a 18th century uh, people. A reenactor. Yeah. But he, like, they do... Uh, the cooking videos is what I started watching. Like they they do these recipes from the ah uh, yeah yeah, yeah. And they like cook it over an open fire. And all I've that seen stuff. that it's, guy. It's pretty cool. Yeah, he wears you know these goofy getups. Yes, but it's Townsend's John Townsend's is like the name of the the whole thing. Yeah, so John the the son of Christopher, he goes on to great import. Mm -hmm. Um, now it's a little bit weird because. John has uh, an apprentice who marries Job's daughter. Hmm. John Goddard was the son of Daniel Goddard and the apprentice of Job Townsend. He married Job's daughter, Hannah Townsend. They're not straying too far from the pumpkin patch. Yeah, like, listen, you want to come apprentice <laughs> under me, you get to also marry my daughter. Oh, my God. <laughs> So, <laughs> but instead of staying for 21 years, for 14 years or whatever it is, you got to stay for 16 years. When I was writing all this down, I was trying to like map it out in my head. We need one of those charts like they have on the um, the PBS show uh, with uh, Henry Louis Gates. Oh, yeah. yeah uh, finding your roots. Mm -hmm. Because I can't really follow it in my head, all yeah. these people marrying it. Um, 21 members of successive generations of these two intermarried families worked as cabinet makers over a period of 120 years. Wow. Selling their products not only in New England, but also in coastal trade and in the West Indies. So you got 21 cabinet makers uh, spilling out of uh, the job. Uh, and Christopher Towns in line. Yeah, and that's then, some that's some good uh, blood. And then yeah, mixed in with the Goddard. Yeah. <laughs> Man, there was some kissing cousins there. Some heavy hitters. <laughs> but it goes to show you, um, that's something that doesn't happen. You you're lucky if you could find like your son to go into your line of work. Yeah, I think the rejection of the sort of family uh, business thing is maybe, I don't know, it's a much bigger thing now where you don't want to yeah. do what the generation before you did. But it was it was an expected way of life. And probably, you know, for the, for the young kids, there was no choice. Mm -hmm. You know, you started working. Maybe, maybe if you weren't needed, you'd get to select some... Uh, other course for yeah. yourself. 
But chances are you were expected to and just did what your dad did. Well, yeah, and by that, by the point that you were ready to go off on your own, you already had this set of skills where it's like, well, right. I'm going to go start over. Right. So what are you going to do? <clears throat> you know, I'm a cabinet maker now. Yeah. Should I learn how to be a printer? And go do a 14-year apprenticeship <laughs> unpaid? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, that's the thing that y- you have to uh, kind of consider. What was life like back then? Mm-hmm. Uh, what was life like in early 1700s, mid-1700s? In the colonies, in Rhode Island. Well, and you talk about just the whole idea of having a craft and the pride that comes with it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's not as much of a thing now. No, definitely. Like, um, I mean, we don't experience it much because uh, we make furniture. But there's there's definitely a a bit of condescension to people who work with their hands. Yeah, and... More people worked in a trade, we'll call it, then, than do now. Like back then, there weren't many jobs that were like a, no. like the jobs you see now, where you work at an office and you you know you're pushing paper and answering phone calls and you know having Zoom meetings. Um, right. Back then, it was you were a furniture maker or a farmer or a banker or a doctor or and they were they were all trades that required um, I don't know. Maybe it's just because I identify with this that maybe my maybe I'm a little biased, but um, yeah, now it's it's not like that, and more people work in jobs that aren't like that. Whereas yeah. back then, that's what everyone did. Everyone had a trade, a vocation. Um, yeah, a livelihood. Yeah, it's, it's a way of life. Mm-hmm. Um, it, we as um, the colonies begin to grow and prosper. You get that mercantile class Mm -hmm. that develops. And in my readings, I kind of came across what is sort of reverse uh, um, feelings. You know, like they were looked upon as people don't do anything. Right. You know, they're just buying and selling. Mm -hmm. And there was a certain amount of contempt for them from the people who were actually the doers, the makers, the people who created something from nothing. Mm Mm-hmm. Whereas the mercantile class, they just kind of shifted stuff around. Right. And they got rich. It's the one percenters. <laughs> Bastards. <laughs> well, well, you and me and our brethren. <laughs> We're out here. <laughs> Getting dirty every day. That's right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the furniture that the Goddard and Townsend family um, did and what was so important about their design work. Okay. Um, now we already discussed last week that Newport, Rhode Island was the, the center of American design where we broke away from the European influence and they kind of worked independently. And we mentioned that they had native born, cabinet makers, and now we see why. (laughs) Because (laughs) for 120 years, they had (laughs) 20 members of the Goddard Townsend family Mm -hmm. line. Uh, So they basically dominated that area. Yeah, a little bit of uh, eugenics going on. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, we know they did good work. We don't know how healthy they were. That's true. (laughs) From all that intermarrying. Um, So the thing that they developed that uh, is so um, identifiable is the block and shell motif. Um, It's probably one of the few things. And there's a nice shell from the Rhode Island uh, furniture archive. It's not a great uh, link as far as like the furniture, we we looked at some things last week that had that that shell motif, oh, yeah, yeah. and we'll probably I'm hoping that my uh, my links will improve and there'll be some some better examples. I tried to go through there as as we were uh, as we were as I was editing it. Mm-hmm. So, but everyone knows that block and shell. Yeah, every, all the furniture folks. And even people who are not real furniture nerds know this thing. 
Oh yeah, you we've all seen it, especially uh-huh. on that Queen Anne. Yeah. So so this is where it comes from. This is the guy that uh, and the family and the and the, the furniture making crew mm-hmm. that make this a thing. Um, and it's become squarely identified with the Newport, Rhode Island uh, school design. Um, so you know it's that alternating concave and convex curve, like a scallop show. There you go. That's the best way to describe it. Yeah, and uh, I didn't say it in the first episode, but if if you sign up for the Patreon, we give this outline with uh, every week, so you can actually go and click all these links. And, and that's cool. So if you want to listen along, you can actually examine these pieces as we as we do. Yeah, and and the links will lead you to other links because yeah. these are, for the most part, great pages mm-hmm. um, with a lot of information that just I had to you know wean away from from the written stuff that we're going through now yeah i mean if it says yale.edu yeah it's no, no slouch of a that, that's part of you know like um doing good research you got it got to get strong source mm-hmm. material um so i'm pretty confident in all this stuff like they say do your own research <laughs> is that, is, is, I can't verify these sources, but yeah, I saw a YouTube video on yeah. this once. I can't vouch for its legitimacy. Yeah, those are actual <laughs> words of a conversation we had yesterday. <laughs> this is a split screen deal over here. This yeah, yeah you're really going to town on this. Yeah. You are CEO of. You guys uh, can see what we got uh, going on over here. Technology. Um, there was a, I don't know if you ever heard of the Village Voice newspaper. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was really big um, in my youth in, in New York. Um, it was like the art of newspaper it would come out Wednesdays, but you could go to the newsstand on Tuesday night, mm-hmm. and it would hit the stands, and it was free. And in the back, it had all of the the musicians wanted, yeah, and it had, yeah, a, yeah. like, who's playing where and everything. Well, they had this comic strip that was running and it's where Matt Groening began. Oh yeah, yeah, with that rabbit, mm-hmm. that crazy rabbit thing. Oh yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. He started in in the Village Voice. Wow. But there was a comic that was, I can't remember the title of it, but it was basically overheard on the subway. Oh yeah. And that's it made, what we were talking about with the research mm-hmm. and the YouTube made me think of that because it would just be. Verbatim, yeah. A conversation <clears throat> overheard on the subway. Yeah, that's been ripped <laughs> off by like every college newspaper in right, the country. Right, right. This yeah. is so that that was the where it began, and um, we just gave you a little taste of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, everybody, everybody who's listening to us on a podcast listens to stuff on the internet, so they've heard their own version of Crazy Talk. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. Hopefully, this isn't Crazy Talk. Yeah, a little bit, but yeah. So, getting back to this block and shell now, um, just because it's got a block and shell uh, motif doesn't mean it was Goddard and Townsend. Mm-hmm. It was, it was super influential. Um, and there are a couple of minor names compared to Townsend and Goddard, Benjamin Baker and Grindel Rawson, mm. uh, big enough to not disappear into um, the black hole of history. But these were also a couple of guys in Providence uh, copying this design. Um, they did the ball and claw foot. Uh, open space between the talon and the ball. That was another one of their things. Wow. Uh, Talk about a pain in the ass. <laughs> My God. I mean, think about the time. But, you know, the, the, the stuff that we've kind of gotten away from is, you know, you and I take a piece from start to finish. Mm-hmm. If we don't know how to do something, we got to learn how to do it. Right. Back then, they were, you know, there was a uh, job was in uh, his little corner of the workshop, and his whole thing might be, carving the ball and claw foot. Yeah. And they had an apprentice who was, you know, for seven years carving this shell. Mm -hmm. It's like a piece would go over to his bench and it would get the carving and then we'll go back to the next guy who was, you know, making the doors. Yeah, they didn't, you know, start at 40 like you and 30 like me. You know, (laughs) they were... They They started at 14. Seven, yeah. By the time they were 40, they were dead. Yeah, right. Yeah, (laughs) that's true. 
Unless you're a dis bro, we all lived yeah. to be like 80 in the 1600s. <laughs> so um, it, it gives you, you know, it's, it's for me, it's fun to think about, you know, the what it was like, what was going on back yeah. then. Um, we could st- we could go on the Townsend website, get some some of those clothes, some yeah, of those old timey tools. <laughs> it would take us a year to make something. Then yeah. <laughs> they come repossess our homes. It costs us twenty five thousand in uh, reproduction uh, gear. Yeah. Um, uh, as far as uh, you know, um, showing how important these guys were, a single mahogany secretary bookcase made by Christopher Townsend, who was. Uh, John's father, mm-hmm. he, he made it in 1740. It sold at auction in New York for $8.25 million. Okay, that we discussed that. John Goddard made a famous six-shell desk bookcase for Provident Merchant, Providence Merchant Nicholas Brown, and it sold at the by the Brown family in 1989 for $12.1 Wow. Um, that was, was yeah, that was the record... For a piece of American furniture. And that we have a picture of, or is that? Uh, oh, no, that's that thing. That's that thing. I wish I had a picture of that. I might be able to find it. Um, yeah, that's something else. So I wonder what it would be worth nowadays. Yeah, um, I mean, that was 32 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the distinction is it's an American piece of furniture. Right. And something from Newport is distinctly American. Mm-hmm. Uh, this caught us when uh, a lot of times I'll be uh, doing this research in the shop while Jeff's working and I'll find something interesting and I'll have to share it with him. And this was one of those things between 1756 and 1800, John Townsend signed his name to, a bit more than 30 pieces of furniture. So you're looking at 44 years of furniture making, and we could attribute, you know, 30, 32 pieces of furniture to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, We don't know if more of that was, you know, lost to history. I'd have to guess, yeah. You know, he was, uh, you know, maybe... The shop in in total was putting out more work, mm-hmm. and maybe just pieces he built were were numbering in the low thirties. Yeah, maybe you know I'm sure there maybe some slip by that he didn't sign, um, you know because we I before we have a branding iron now which we've mm-hmm. used a couple times. Which actually, it's way more difficult to use than you would expect. <laughs> You'd think you'd just, yeah. it's not like branding a, a piece of uh, leather or something. No, or and a it's, piece a, of meat or... it's a complicated brand. Uh, but, like, I would tend to sign stuff before that, but a lot of stuff left the shop with no mm-hmm. mark at all. So, oh yeah, 100 years from now, if it's still around, which hopefully it is, there's nothing to identify it as a green street. That's right. And you know some things had to have slipped through the cracks with, you know, right in 44 years. Um. Now, again, I'm taking this from the from the Yale archive, so it must mean something. And it says that his signatures document a remarkable body of work. Mm-hmm. So I guess that was that was a lot of output. Yeah. And secures him a special place in the history of American cabinet making. Uh, and we know that from our earlier research, one piece by uh, great, 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 great grandpa Nick. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of this stuff just is lost to yeah. history. Um, and it, it kind of points to the fact that, uh, he knew what, what he was doing. Um, it, I wrote his habit of adding the date suggests an acute historical awareness hmm. and a determination to document his legacy. Not bad. Yeah, so you see more, as we were talking last episode, more of this movement towards the identity of the maker. Mm-hmm. You know, where- yeah, yeah. And he may have only signed his best stuff. Yeah. Like us, we don't always get to make everything yeah. that we want. Um, because it, I, it, they also note 
without exception, all the signed pieces are of the highest quality. Yeah. So he may have only signed what he thought was his best stuff. Yeah, the stupid melamine tree that, you know, we still haven't been paid for. <laughs> no still sign. haven't been paid for. And when you yeah. listen to this three weeks from now, we probably still haven't That's been right, paid for. That's right, you're right. <laughs> um, yeah, there's no, we didn't sign that. All right. Um, let me let me go through a couple of quotes that describe um, Townsend, John Townsend in particular. Um, he's, of course, one of the most prominent of the cabinet makers from mm-hmm. that area. A perfectionist who adhered tr- to tradition. He delegated little and was constitutionally incapable of cutting corners, either by stinting on the rich mahogany he favored or dispensing with such labor-intensive construction features as cross-brace supports and tenon brackets. My man. Yeah, yeah. Um Labor-intensive refinements are evident in the interiors as well as the ex- exteriors of every documented piece. Uh-huh. So he's he's finishing and fitting these pieces out, you know, top to bottom, inside and out. Um, and uh, it, his his style and his his uh, attention to detail are really evident in everything that he signed. Um, let's see what I got here. So up till Townsend, Goddard, you got Boston, Mm -hmm. kind of reigning supreme. And these are the guys that bring Providence to prominence. Is that a tongue twister? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, they, you know, they did something different, a little bit different. Um, when you think of furniture, that picture right there mm-hmm. of this period, again, it, that's that's what you have in your mind, yeah. isn't it? That's, uh, you know, undeniably Queen Anne. Mm-hmm. Uh, I write, the bonnet top high chest, the most fashionable and enduringly popular piece of 18th century case furniture, was developed in Boston. Newport took this innovation and made it altogether richer and more memorable by adding a shell motif to the blocking. The shell, so evident in Townsend's work, became the signature feature, the emblem of Newport furniture. Hmm. So there you go. Yeah, so it's got the cabriole legs with mm-hmm. the ball and claw foot. See, the pediment's actually closed on that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is unique. I haven't actually seen that before Me that I can remember. Um, it's really a nice, well-balanced piece. Of course, we're talking about it like <laughs> we could do that. Yeah. <laughs> like the cook at McDonald's talking about, uh, fine dining. I know. It's a little humbling, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it, it's just remarkable. Yeah. Um, again, the flame finial. Yeah. Yeah. Even these, you see he has these panels up here, these raised panels yep. that mimic yep. the drawers rather than having a completely flat. Yeah, really nice touch. Mm-hmm. I will say, though, this uh, spacing over here it needs a little <laughs> adjustment on this uh, yeah. drawer. Well, it may, have, it may have sagged a little in the last 270 years. Um, yeah, hopefully there's not a lot of um, restoration work done to, like, uh, straighten it out. But yeah, you could see some of the bottom drawers are not quite uh, yeah. in alignment. And, uh, you know, we don't know how well it operates. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's it's certainly gorgeous. Oh, yeah. Um, so that's Newport right there. That's where they they take um, the, the Boston piece, refine it, and that's all down to Townsend and Goddard. Uh, now we're getting to the late, uh, late mid 1700s. Mm-hmm. And this is again, how time and place affect furniture making. The British occupy Newport in 1777. Um, 
people are still trying to make a living. The revolution's going on, but it doesn't yeah. mean that time and place stop. Uh, and the city's bankrupted. Oy. Uh, they called this the golden age of Newport furniture making, and it's basically empty, uh, uh, ended. Um, industry in general declines. Um, and although Pembroke tables and, um, Townsend making some really nice pieces of, uh, block and shell furniture after the war, uh, it's sometimes said that with the federal style that comes in, John Townsend's heart was no longer in his work. Wow. So he develops this whole design aesthetic. You could see how passionate he is about it. We went over his work ethic. Mm -hmm. And then he becomes passe. Yeah, I mean, a revolution happened. I mean, war tore through the colonies. And, I mean, you could see how mm -hmm. that that may uh, make you lose your drive a little bit. Yeah. So th this, is, this is the end of an era. Um, the revolution occurs. There's rough times in the colonies, yeah. especially um, Providence. It's bankrupted. Mm -hmm. Newport. Um, uh, yeah, Newport. I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, a new style comes into vogue post-revolution. And, and poor uh, Goddard, he's just not into it. But the name continues on. I mm -hmm. mean, we know that there were 120 years of that line. Yeah. But the guy who started it all kind of like, eh, F it. He hung up his hat. <laughs> you feel like that some days. <laughs> you know when I felt like that? When <laughs> we started getting all, every design that came in was white painted shaker. Yeah, thanks God like, they are all Oh, gone. my God. You're like beating them off with a stick. You know, I can't take it anymore. Yeah. They still they're still out there. They're just not calling us. Yeah, yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Um, so who's next in the uh in the big uh That's our lineup? boy, Thomas Chippendale. Right. Thomas Chippendale. Um <laughs> this was a great quote. Some experts consider him Britain's greatest cabinet maker ever. Hmm. The Shakespeare of English furniture makers. Well, now it's funny that, you know, we're talking about American furniture and Thomas Chippendale yeah. is like the influencer of, um, you know, American furniture. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was thinking that very same thing. This guy, his impact was so far and wide that you, you can't, you know, avoid it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll read this uh, quote from... Robert Copley, Christie's International Head of Furniture. <laughs> nice job, title. <laughs> Take it for what you will. <laughs> Thomas Chippendale is without question Britain's greatest cabinet maker. He excelled in every style he worked in, from the whimsical Rococo and the fashion for all things Chinese in his early career to the neoclassical with its straight lines derived from the ancient world. His reputation spread far beyond the shores of his homeland, indeed, and his genius is reflected in the number of beautifully designed and executed pieces of furniture that survive in excellent condition nearly 250 years after his death. Um, yeah, that kind of puts a little uh, exclamation point on what some people think of Chippendale. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's quite a... Uh Quite a reputation to live up to. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're going to get into just why Chippendale, the British cabinet maker, mm -hmm. is so important to American furniture design. Right. Um, uh, we don't know much about his early life. Uh, they say he was probably trained by his father, who was not like a super skilled craftsman. Right. Uh, he worked as a mason. And they think he may have apprenticed with somebody named Robert Wood. Okay. So he he doesn't have a really 
um, deeply entrenched uh, background. Uh, this is a little tidbit. We know he was married twice and had 12 kids. Damn. <laughs> Go, Thomas. Yeah. So... Uh, in, so we're in the 1750s now. In mm -hmm. 1754, he's working in London, and he's got a pretty big company. He's got 50 journeymen cabinet makers. Wow. And he had to pull from <laughs> uh, several states to get that many. That's right. <laughs> so he's working in London. And uh, tell everybody what the esteemed name of Chippendale's furniture shop was the cabinet and upholstery warehouse. <laughs> Can't think of a more, uh, I don't know, unassuming, more unassuming name than yeah. that. Now, that sounds like a place we'd see on Highway 36 yeah. selling furniture from China. This Sunday at the <laughs> cabinet and upholstery warehouse, 25% off all. Cabinet, 0% financing, free delivery. Yeah, well, what happens that year changes furniture-making history, though. Um, on the screen, we have uh, uh, an actual, uh, I guess you call it a screenshot from the pages mm -hmm. of what they call the trade catalog. We would, you know, probably call it a book. Right. Um, Chippendale publishes The Gentleman and Cabinet Maker's Director. And he's the first to do such a thing. And it really launches his career. Everything we know about Chippendale basically happens post-publishing of uh, The Director. Yep. I mean, he's un undeniably Chippendale with these ribbon right. motifs here in the top of these two things. So, so what is the gentleman and cabinet maker's director? Um, it's 160 plans for furniture that could be built for clients. And it was intended for other cabinet makers to copy. Wow. So what this, the going rate was for that back in the day. I'll tell you exactly what the going rate was. Oh, okay. <laughs> Three cents. No. Three shillings. <laughs> Funny you should ask. <laughs> Chippendale, the astute businessman, he was trying to promote the trade. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't like he was, you know, sort of like secreting away his stuff. Right. His intention in uh, publishing the, the director was to sign up 400 subscribers, 400 cabinet shops, right. and he would give them a discounted pre-publishing mm. price. And they'd get the 160 plates, as it would, would be called, wow. uh, for 1.14 shillings. Or uh, if you wanted it unbound, 1.1 shilling. And uh, I did a little digging, and that's about $5 in today's money. It seems extremely seems awfully cheap. awfully cheap, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. A subscriber would have to pay 50% down, and uh, if you wanted the book when it was published, you'd get a discount. Uh, and the idea was that a bookshop would mark it up. Hmm. So um, I saw a video on this, and I can't vouch for its accuracy. <laughs> I was going to say, just the fact that 50% down makes me think that it that maybe that conversion is off. Yeah, I I you know, I had to go to like websites where it would it would say like, you know, what's a shilling of 1750 mm -hmm. worth in today's money kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it, that might not be accurate that that $5. You know, I would think there's got to be another zero or so attached to that. Yeah, I mean, if you got to put a down payment, then it's got to be a large sum. Right. Otherwise, right. just pay it. You know, pay it all for five bucks. You just get ten of them. Exactly. So he puts together this book with 160 of his designs, wow. which in and of itself is is quite a feat. Yeah, I'd be lucky if I could come up with 16 original designs. Uh, and um, it's intended for others to copy. Mm -hmm. 
So he's thinking ahead. You know what it made me think of? Remember when Apple and IBM came out, like the PC versus Apple? How old do you think I am? <laughs> well, in the before there was the iPod, which mm-hmm. kind of saved Apple. Yeah. They were dying a slow death. Mm. The only people using Mac computers were like artists and graphics companies. Schools. Because, yeah, because the, the software was designed in such a way that it was it was better suited for that. Right. And the machines were a lot more expensive. Mm-hmm. But what Gates did was he made the PC, he made his, what do you call uh, his software? Um, Windows. Windows. He made Windows available to all the other computers. Yeah. So whether it was Hewlett Packard, mm-hmm. uh, IBM, Gateway, Dell, he said, license my stuff. Mm-hmm. And and that's what it made me think of. Yeah. He was looking at this bigger picture. Yeah. Well, it's no wonder you see so much influence in in the States from a guy in London mm-hmm. because he was selling these, they could take it and... And they didn't even have to copy it exactly because they, you know, they were in, injecting their own style and materials and everything into it. So it's no shock that he was such a big influence in the U.S. because he was putting all this out there for other people to see. It's not like you right. had to go to London and study under him to learn how to build Chippendale furniture. Yeah. Well, you could just buy the director and, uh, the, you know, the gentleman and the cabinet maker's director and know how to make 160 pieces of Chippendale furniture. That's a great title, right? Yeah. <laughs> Because, but not as good as the <laughs> the furniture and a, the ca- <clears throat> cabinet and upholstery warehouse. <laughs> Apparently, he sought out some advice before yeah. before naming. My God, like, listen, his book. <laughs> listen, Tommy, you got to do something about this name. Um, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> forgot what? Oh, you know. Not just cabinet makers bought the book. Mm-hmm. Like um, architects bought it. Uh, uh, rich folks bought it. You know, people in new nobility. Yeah, because they yeah, and they would. I'm sure they would commission people to build. Mm-hmm. You know, they might have this book, and they might go to the local guy and say, "Can you build me something like this?" Right, because you know, it's seen as this uh, sort of highfalutin. You know, it's the hottest trend in Europe, so. Yeah. We want to have the same thing here. I'm a mercantile and I, I want to be, you know, live lavishly. So it makes you wonder. I mean, obviously it's, it's a success mm-hmm. because we know Chippendale's name and we know everything that follows. Is the, does the book or do, do the designs propel Chippendale forward? Like, does the access to these designs... I mean, you'd have to think that it that it would. I mean, they maybe they work hand in hand. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess you can't you know take them in a vacuum either one. But if he doesn't publish the book, what happens? Yeah, I mean, you look at guys like Maloof. Same thing. He gets right. a photographer, puts out this book. He's he's rubbing elbows with all these you know rich folks, and what happens? He blows up. Yeah, yeah. So it's sort of, and you know, the difference is that like this Chippendale stuff is is crazy hardcore. Like he is yeah. really it's doing, great. yeah. Like the Maloof stuff is, I, I don't know, maybe I'm in the mi- minority, but I'm not a huge fan of the Maloof stuff. To me, it's not that. It's nothing s- super special. Right. It's it's nice in its own right, but it's nothing like this. You know, comparing what was going on to what Chippendale was doing, he's really, you know in a whole different league than than most of the other people. Yeah. Um, That's what I take from it. That in, in last week's episode, we mentioned he didn't invent really any of this stuff from whole cloth, Mm -hmm. but he took these elements and really refined them and really gave it a language its own. And he's trained 50 guys to do it. Right. So he's got a whole, crew of, of 50 people who are able to create this, you know, highly intricate and revolutionary kind of furniture. And for, for those that follow along and can see the visual, (laughs) 
check out a piece of Chippendale furniture. Check out this drawing. Yeah. And tell me you're going to make it. Especially this one. I mean, come Look on. Look at the, the profile. Yeah. Just the different heights and depths. and. Yep. It, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you, cause so you, so you got to have your act together to grab this book and then reproduce one of these pieces. Yeah. In 1759. Uh-huh. So, so in the book, what, what is the gentleman and cabinet maker's director? It's got household furniture, chairs, sofa, beds, commodes. Hmm. Now, commode, not like what we think of a commode. Yeah, it's, it's totally confused me. Yeah. It's like I had to look it up. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's like a piece of furniture with drawers, shelves. Um, it's not until... Um, becomes part of like American slang that it, it refers to like a, you know, a toilet. Right. Uh, clothes, presses, clocks, writing tables, bookcases. Now I'm wondering like, did Gustav Stickley read this book? Of because course. he goes and publishes the craftsman, which yes. is, it's the same exact thing. My thought. Exactly. It's the same exact thing. And the drawings are not that far off. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of those books, mm -hmm. you know, with excerpts from them, you know, because later publishers have subdivided the book. He went even crazier. And instead of doing a one shot deal, he did, a, I, don't know, I guess it was monthly or maybe mm -hmm. even more frequent than that. But it was a, a regular publication. And there's I don't even know how many issues, but um, he was he was a little a uh, little smart. Yeah, that's a, a great, great point. Um uh, one of the preeminent, you know, American furniture makers to follow mm -hmm. is definitely influenced by this. Yeah. And even though he's working in a completely different style. Only difference, Gustav Stickley was putting it in the hands of regular people. Yes. Um, he was going for the regular Joe, like not a, not a professional furniture maker. Mm -hmm. It was more for you know he wanted it he wanted regular people to make their own furniture yeah that was the whole idea, idea was yeah it, you know hey we should this shouldn't be a crazy you know endeavor to get a nice piece of furniture you can make it yourself yeah yeah um so he's got all these designs and it's in all three of uh chippendale styles include with the fourth being the english mm -hmm. um uh, we touched on it Last week, uh, English was sort of like the deep carvings. That's what most people think of, uh, you know, the the Chippendale thing being French Rococo or Rococo. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Where, is that going to be our this uh, week's Jacobean? No, no. <laughs> I think it's it Rococo. Happen. I've always heard Rococo. Yeah. That's in the style of Louis the Fifteenth. So that's, again, drawn straight out of Europe. Mm -hmm. Gothic, yep. Um, quatrefoils, and which we looked up a bit of that when we were doing some church work. Yep. Fret work, uh, which also appears in the Chinese mm -hmm. style, where he introduces lacquer. Yep. Um, you know, and and a lot of that stuff was black uh, and lattice work, fret work. Uh, so the director is marketed to cabinet makers 308 people initially subscribed so he, he nearly uh almost he nearly, hits his goal yeah mostly craftsmen uh but also architects some sculptors and members of the nobility i have to add this to the list of, bo of books to pick up because yeah i'm sure you can get it it's amazing that we you know that these records still exist mm -hmm. that we know they were sculptors that bought the yeah, subscription. You could probably see back here <laughs> since last segment, I got three books added to uh, added to yeah, these. Yeah. So maybe by the end of the season, it'll be. Yeah, we're going. I'm definitely going to pick up a copy of that book. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, he includes. He's not holding back. He includes all his styles of work, and um, 160 plans in total. Wow. And and this is it. Since the director was used by other cabinet makers, a lot of recognizably Chippendale furniture was built. Dublin, Philadelphia, Lisbon, which is Portugal, Copenhagen, Hamburg, 
are just a few cities that produced quite a bit of Chippendale designs. Look at this effing uh, Wow. I mean, that, to me, that doesn't scream Chippendale. It doesn't. They got um, a nice piece of glass on the top. Yeah, <laughs> I know. What a shame. <laughs> this must be in an Italian grandma's house. I know. We all know what that does. Is that plastic on the chair? <laughs> Uh, it doesn't, but, you know, it does mention that he got into the neoclassicism, mm -hmm. so you could see that in I mean, that total Greek yeah. influence here. It yeah. looks like a piece of pottery. Yes. Yes. And it's kind of a take off on the block and shell motif there in the middle. Yeah. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. Um, the guy was an artist. Absolutely. It, it It's just amazing. Interesting feet, you know, departing from the more um, compound curves of the cabriolet. These are just sort of tapered with a little block foot, like yeah. a little bun foot yeah. at the bottom. Yeah, I mean, just look at the fans in the corner of the panels. Just all of this molding. You know, this could have just been a miter, but no, yeah. it's, a du it's doubled up, curved here on the side. Yeah. All oh, this marquetry. I mean, insane. This would take us five years to build. <laughs> yeah, because it would include a year of classes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The figure in the wood that's chosen. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, is this the beginning of veneer work as we know it? Yeah, maybe. This quadruple book match, whatever the hell you call that. In the corners. Right, right. They don't just leave it alone. Um, it's it's really stunning. I, I would urge anybody who's listening only, especially this episode, and maybe it's going to be like this for this series of podcasts. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, we build furniture, so it's a visual art. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to see these things. Yeah, head over to the YouTube because I'm going to have these. It'll be up over here. Yeah, you really want to check <clears throat> it out to... To fully appreciate it, because I didn't fully appreciate um, the the depth of his influence and artistry. Uh, you know, because you hear the name so often, it just becomes a bit, you know... Uh, it gets watered down. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, Chippendale this, uh, Chippendale that. Oh, it, it just becomes a style. You don't realize there was a guy behind all this that... Yeah. Um, you know, he pulled this out. So it's a huge success. Yeah. Huge. Insanely influential. Um, as I mentioned, his work is now being produced all over the world. Um, and the rich especially are, are enamored of this. And they yeah. really are looking for uh, whole rooms of Chippendale uh, work. Because he does, you know, the the book goes into that. Right. And I wrote down, think Downton Abbey, because as I'm going through, you know, all these pictures. I never watched it, but yeah, I know the. It's like know the aesthetic that you're. Yeah, like the the outside of these homes. Uh, unfortunately, most of the links I had come across was just the outside of these like castles. Mm -hmm. uh, but few interior shots, you know, 20 foot tall ceilings. Yeah. You know, all I mean, the look at the furniture. gilding on the wall. Right. <laughs> Wallpaper with gold. It's not even gilding. It's literal, like, pieces of gold-plated metalwork. Yeah, yeah. He, the clock is probably a Chippendale design. The mm -hmm. chairs. Um, Got a little cherub on top. And the other thing, you know, he talked about was the fabric and, and, and soft furnishings. He was... He was into all of this. He would Full pick out gold leaf chair. Yeah. Look at how the fabric, the design in the fabric is set within the, you know, the framework of the chair and the wallpaper. Exactly. Nothing is, you know, left to chance. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have to say, although I don't imagine myself building in this style um, anytime in the near future, I become a bit of a Chippendale fanboy. Yeah, uh, it it's after reading about it and seeing all this stuff, it's hard not to. So, 
all the way from England, Chippendale becomes one of the preeminent figures in American furniture design mm-hmm. during this period, during the uh, early American and, col- well, colonial, right? Yeah. Period. Yeah, and although, you know, he's not here in the U.S. producing furniture, he is the, you know, he is the guy. Yeah. His ideas are here. Mm-hmm. His plans are here. And um, he's the it dude. Wow. Very interesting. So that was that was pretty interesting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I hadn't I've never had heard of, you know, his his plans being published and all that. I mean, yeah. it really gives a lot of uh, insight behind what was going on here. A lot of insight behind why he was so influential. Right. So we could compare, you know, the two the two main figures I found you have the well, and we'll com- we'll call the Townsend and Goddard family in line. We'll call that we'll Call that one right uh or these uh native rhode islanders mm-hmm. and then a brit yeah uh two totally well no, i want to say two totally they both drew from the same well yeah and you know that those guys in newport were reading the chippendale stuff i'm sure mm-hmm. they had to have been yeah it's it'd be impossible to to miss um it'd be like us you know, ignoring everything we saw on the internet. Right. <laughs> we can't. We can't. <laughs> Much as we might try to avoid some things, mm-hmm. we can't. Yeah, like how many furniture publications were there in 1750? Yeah, his was the very first to ever occur. Right. So um, it might be uh, interesting to find out if anything followed you know, we don't know because, you know, we're not scholars. Right. We're, 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 no, we will, we'll be semi scholars by the time this series is over. Yeah. Uh, I'm hoping that I can retain s- some of what I've been learning. If not, you just go back and listen to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> if I could stay in the sound of my own voice. <laughs> when we open the Green Street School, it's going to be a. Uh, 101 it's just going to be a sit and listen to 48 episodes of the podcast that's two credits yeah it's a two credit course yep. um yeah you know it, it's like i've got uh, and especially in this episode i've i feel like some enthusiasm and a, and a little excitement yeah. and i hope that some of that translates to uh, our listeners, I know that our first season was really more like shooting the breeze, talking about tools, yep. what's going on, um, taking listener uh, calls, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And this is a real departure from that. But w- that's something we chose to do. We wanted to, to, to I mean, this is kind of like what we do in the shop. Right. We are always reaching and. Uh, some things do not go as planned, like our, our steam bending oak. <laughs> we won't talk about that. <laughs> but we prevail in the end. Yep. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there are going to be some people that don't share our enthusiasm for this topic. We'll lose some listeners. I, I'm hoping that we're going to gain uh, more listeners with with this kind of uh spin on um information and and how to uh kind of uh, make it make learning a little bit enjoyable while people are uh going about their day cuz that's kind of how people listen to a podcast yeah they're, you know they're working uh it can be a little bit of a background noise and that kind of thing yeah i mean hopefully it's incentivizing people to actually maybe revisit the episode sit down and and get this source material in front of them and look at the pictures and and really dissect these pieces of furniture the way we are. Um, yeah. It's inspiring. <clears throat> yeah, because if you want to improve your your design and your woodworking, it is. It's a it's an active pursuit. It's not it doesn't just happen on its own. Right. Um and you know, you need to look at the past to to learn these things. 
That's exactly it. Uh, I'm uh, a bit uh, shaded toward that direction because I <laughs> have a degree in history. Right. So I have a certain appreciation for history. Um, and it's also interesting to think about all the other folks that did stuff that didn't put their name on things mm-hmm. that are just lost to history. Yeah. Cause that's, that's part of it. That's part of our combined history. We're all standing on the shoulders of the people who came before us. Yeah. Um, uh, whether that's 20 years ago, 50, a hundred, mm-hmm. 200. Um, and part of what I studied in, uh, historiography, the writing of history is, like what happens to all those stories that disappear? I mean, it, it, what ha- it, it it impacts what we see as the truth, and oh, yeah. and you know what we think is you know a totality of knowledge. Mm-hmm. There may be some unknowns out there. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're not we're we're not talking about the guys who tried something different back then and. And right now, nobody knows who they were. Yeah, you know, exactly. there's some funky piece of furniture out there from 1740, guaranteed that looked nothing like any of this stuff that other people were building. But people didn't like it, and that guy died, and now it's gone. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, again, and it'd also be interesting to see um, now that like furniture making is a thing now, mm-hmm. like with. Uh, Chippendale and Goddard, um, and we saw with the with uh, Grandpa Nick, um, the first to sign a piece. Yeah. Now this is a thing. This is like the Beatles. You know, people didn't know you could make millions from publishing pop music. Yeah. Uh, after that, people were a lot less reluctant to sign away their their royalties. Yeah, yeah. So now I wonder if we're going to learn of more and more craftsmen because they signed their work, they Mm -hmm. dated their work. And of course it's going to be younger than as we go forward in, in time. Yeah. You saw like in the first, the first set with early American, there's only a handful of names that you can even Mm -hmm. identify, you know, attribute to that period. And now as you get into this next one, you got your Townsend, your Goddard, your Chippendales, all these guys, I'm sure there's a ton of names in Newport, all, all those names in Newport. Um, and as we get further, this list of names for each period is definitely going to get longer and longer. Yeah, yeah. That's going to be curious and interesting. Yeah. Um, ah. You know, I would never ha- never think that we would be considered, uh, you know, by um, anybody talking like this in the future. But by signing our work, I always think it's more of a novelty. Like in 50 years' time, somebody's going to rip out a kitchen mm-hmm. or somebody's going to pull a piece of furniture up and go, Oh, green street joinery. That's oh, kind of curious. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've done that myself ripping up, ripping out old stuff, finding signatures from, you know, but you know, what's cool. The internet. Yeah. Things are going to last forever in some regard. Mm-hmm. So it, it, we don't know if people will be around in 50 yeah, years, yeah. but maybe they, maybe we will, maybe society will survive. And in 70 years, there will be archives and some will type in green street joinery Yeah, and it'll, or Instagram will come up. Yeah. They'll say there was this thing called Instagram yeah, back in podcast. the twenty twenties. Holy cow, man. They were primitive. <laughs> Yeah, you're going like this, like they'll be typing. They'll just be oh, thinking yeah. about it, and it'll show That's up right. in their brain. Oh, man. So should we thank everybody? Yeah, so we'll thank the uh, Gold Tier patrons, Adam Podhast, Colin Lai, Corey Ty, David Murphy, David Shoemaker, Jerry Greenan, Keith Drennan, and Manny Siriani. I don't know why I keep uh, messing up Manny's. Manny, Manny Siriani. Yeah, Manny. Yeah. Two Manny mistakes. Getting tongue-tied. Yeah. And uh, we want to plug uh, vesting. Yeah, so uh, vesting finishes. Uh, save 10% with the code American Craftsman. They're over uh, at rpmcodingsolutions.com. Um, that's their, their you know, sort of like sister company where they sell sell the product. Mm-hmm. So they have uh, hard wax oils, LED finishes. They have zero VOC lacquer, all kinds of cool stuff. 
Um, really, really nice finishes, so you can check them out. We're not just shills for the company. No, no, we use yeah. it, and uh, you know, it'll help the podcast. We are we are affiliates. We have to disclose that that uh, you know, we will get a little little slice we of get a little kickback. Yeah, <laughs> say you know, <laughs> got to support that's the, the only podcast. Way to put it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's you guys know how it works. Um, but yeah, really, really nice finish. Yeah, we use it in the shop, so yep. that's that's. Uh, what we that's all we can say mm -hmm. you know we don't use it because they're giving it to us or anything like no, that yeah we use it because we prefer it yeah 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 we're buying the finish too so all right so everybody have a great day yeah we appreciate it we'll see you uh for episode what's it gonna be seven yeah season wow. two episode seven see you next week <laughs>